Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to part two of CT of calocele abnormalities in the kidney, pearls and pitfalls. I left off last time starting with the urothelial carcinomas. When we think about things that involve the calices, we can speak about medullary sponge kidney. We'll talk about papillary necrosis. But the most important thing, perhaps, is transitional cell carcinoma. We described how they can be small. They're best seen typically on excretory phase, and they can be multiple. Here's an example of multifocal TCCs, at least four or five of them within the patient's left kidney. Uh, we do make the point, correctly so, that the best phase for seeing TCC is in the excretory phase. Here's a patient with hematuria. There's a cyst in the left kidney, but look at this one area right here. Now that's very subtle. You would read that as negative. It's the reason why if you don't see stones, you gotta give IV contrast for hematuria. Well here now, when we give contrast early phase imaging, look at this region here by the pelvis. Is that anything? You measure it, it's enhanced to 64. So it enhanced from about 20 to 64. That's the subtlest sign of a mass on early phase imaging. But you can see it's pretty easy to walk by. Here it is on the coronal view. It's kind of sitting, if I go back and forth, right there in the upper pole, it's kind of filling in. See, it looks different here than it does here. This is more water density. This is soft tissue density. You have to be able to recognize this because perhaps you're not doing a hematuria study, you're doing an abdominal study, and this is the only finding. So it can be a very important finding. Here it is on the 3D imaging. Again, the different density between the upper pole calyces and the lower pole, with the lower pole being normal. And then, of course, as you go from that phase, venous, you got to look again very carefully at this area. Think about it. Again, maybe your only phase. But when you go to the excretory phase, look how much easier it is because you see a bit of contrast, but only a bit. Here you can see this infiltration of the mid to upper pole calyx with minimal contrast, but that's an infiltrating transitional cell carcinoma, particularly nicely shown on the MIP imaging. There's a destruction of the mid pole calyx, the upper pole calyx. It's interesting how obvious the destruction is when you're looking at these images the MIP that is, and even if you're looking at the coronal excretory phase, it's a bit less obvious. Again, it's important to routinely look at the MIP to look at the calyces, but I think the image at the left, the lack of opacification of the upper pole calyces make it easier. But again, to me, MIP imaging is particularly valuable in looking at the ureter and looking at the bladder and in looking at calyceal destruction. Here's another patient, TCC, left kidney, again, upper and lower pole. You would even worry about something on the right kidney. So that's the summary of what we just looked at. Another case, same thing. Look at the left renal pelvis. It looks like there's a soft tissue density here compared to the density of the right renal pelvis. And then you look and you can see as you go back and forth in the coronal view, there's a soft tissue infiltration. I know it's subtle. You may say, well, maybe this is just some blood clotted there. There it is again on the coronal and on the volume rendered views. There's something filling in the mid to lower pole calyces, which becomes much more obvious as you go to excretory phase imaging. Here's the difference. This is layering, right? This is soft tissue infiltration. Layering, soft tissue infiltration. Of course, when you look at the coronal views, you can see the lack of contrast because of the layering. And here, the infiltration, as well as the irregularity, the shagginess, that's calyceal destruction, renal pelvis destruction by an infiltrating transitional cell carcinoma. Again, nicely shown on the MIP imaging. Very, very classic. Now, I mentioned with TCC, and I just showed you two cases of relatively small tumors, not the smallest you've ever seen. Here's a case with transitional cell involving the right kidney. Transitional cells can be bulky, be confused with classic RCCs, particularly papillary, can be confused with lymphoma. And in this case, you can see a large amount of paraortic adenopathy. So 
TCCs are not always going to be only the calyces and small. They can be large, infiltrating a large portion of the kidney, giving adenopathy, and also renal vein involvement can occur. Here's just a few more images showing you on the patient's venous phase, the extensive adenopathy in the aortocaval space, just the anterior to the aorta as well, as well as the infiltration and irregularity of the upper half of the right kidney. And here it is very nicely shown, venous phase imaging, that infiltrating pattern. Again, I could still think about papillary, but one thing we're not arguing about this is tumor. I mentioned that it could be lymphoma. Lymphoma is usually bilateral, usually bulkier, but a lot of nodes are present. This could be lymphoma, couldn't argue against it. And here's the excretory phase imaging, where you're seeing the lack of contrast opacification of the lower two-thirds of the calyces of the patient's right kidney. The left kidney, the calyces look okay. With cinematic rendering, that infiltration, that tissue and texture mapping, very nicely shown with cinematic rendering, uh, well-defined in this case. Now, a couple things I want to mention, just so you'll think about them. And I put this after the TCCs rather than before for a reason. One of them is calyceal diverticuli. Calyceal diverticulate may not opacify early on, and so it can be confused with a tumor. You can see stone formation in diverticuli, but not necessarily. You can have other complications from infection to rupture to XGP to abscess, and occasionally even malignancies. But calyceal diverticuli can be confusing. You can see a type 1 and type 2 here. The type 2 are probably the most confusing. Sometimes you'll see a stone in the kidney with an cystic component, and you know it's a stone in a calyceal diverticulum. You can see on the image number D the uh, changes in the calyceal diverticulum. Again, it changes the and loses cortex in the kidney. So you'll think of something else like infection. You'll even think of tumor, but it's something very important. Sometimes the calyceal diverticulum more commonly will not opacify early. You may need to get delayed scans if you want it to opacify. The last thing I'll comment on is papillary necrosis. The renal medulla and papilla are vulnerable to ischemic necrosis because of the unique arrangement of their blood supply and local interstitial hypertonicity. There are risk factors for papillary necrosis. Diabetes, analgesic abuse, common, high-dose non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, common in sickle cell disease, infections such as TB or chronic pylo, can occur with other reasons, acute urinary obstruction, renal vein thrombosis and chronic alcohol abuse. It varies greatly in severity and rate of progression. Hematuria is commonly present as is decreased renal function, but it's very variable. There's an excellent article by Satomi Kawamoto, and I recommend you read that article, talking about papillary necrosis. You're seeing the normal calyces, and then the medullary type of papillary necrosis, and the papillary type and then eventually calyceal blunting. The medullary type is something we're all familiar with, central erosion of the papilla with a ball on tree appearance, is that golf on T appearance, people often will say. The papillary type, the entire papilla may become necrotic, bilateral phonocele erosions with a lobster claw appearance. Necrotic papillae retained in the calus after sloughing, looking like blood clot. The typical progression of papillary necrosis is reversible ischemic change, necrosis and sloughing of papillary tissue into the pelvic calyceal systems, contrast material filled papillary cavities, and blunting of the calyces. So there's a range of appearances. Here's a patient with a history of migraine headaches and using analgesics. This is papillary necrosis with the central type of uh, papilla erosion, known as the medullary type, that ball on T, or ball on tree appearance, but it's ball on T, it's like a golf ball. You can see it very nicely. You can see it at times in one calyx or in multiple calyces, very nicely shown in this example, where both kidneys are involved and multiple calyces. Here's a patient with a history of prior UTIs, presented with a renal abscess but you can see multiple areas of papillary necrosis 
involving multiple of the calices. Again, uh, wide windows in C allow you to see it, but also in D, the MIP imaging is particularly good. You also see a regularity and narrowing of the upper pole calyx. You have to be careful, I think, sometimes with papillary necrosis. It can look in many ways similar to an infiltrating transitional cell carcinoma. Another case of papillary necrosis with a slough papilla. This is that lobster claw appearance, very, very nicely shown on the MIP imaging where the entire papilla is uh, worn away. It becomes necrotic and sloughs, and that's why you have that lobster claw appearance. Another example with a slough papilla, very nicely shown. And again, you can see here the uh, nice schematic diagram showing you that lobster claw. I'm not sure it's the best lobster claw I've ever seen, but hey, in radiology science, you have to go with what you get. Here's another patient with renal and urinary tract tuberculosis. One thing with TB, you get thickening and enhancement of the ureter. Often you get thickening of the bladder. The kidney is often small. You may see calcification, and you do get papillary necrosis. TB of the GU tract accounts for about 15 to 20 percent of TB infections outside the lung. It results from hematogenous seeding of bacilli in the glomerular and peritubular capillary bed. Regional spread of bacilli results into seeding into the renal pelvis, ureters, and bladder. So multiple areas of involvement, again, can very much simulate TCC. Again, you have to think about it because we really don't think that often about TB of the urinary tract. Here's another patient who had TB, very nicely showing you multiple sites of papillary necrosis, more of a T appearance in the upper pole of the right kidney, and more of that uh, claw-like appearance, lower pole of left kidney. Again, this case makes the point that you can see both types of changes within the same patient. Another patient, hematuria, no calcifications on the non-contrast scans. You give contrast, the kidneys do function, um, not a whole lot of abnormality of note, but then you get to the excretory phase and you can see the zones of papillary necrosis, making the point that you need excretory phase imaging and you need widened window and you need MIP imaging if you want to see papillary necrosis. Very nicely shown in this case, particularly on the right side upper pole and left side mid pole calyces, but there are other calyces involved. Another patient with sickle cell disease with papillary necrosis. So again, lots of different uh, entities to think about. Sickle cell is one of the things we always need to think about papillary necrosis. Sickle cell has a not uncommon uh, association with renal disease, particularly infection, but papillary necrosis is something you also want to think about. So in summary, CTRography is the study of choice for evaluation of painless growth and microscopic hematuria. Routine use of wide window settings is critical if you want to detect papillary or calyceal abnormalities. It's important. Wide window 550 over 50 is a classic window. Also, routine use of coronal MIP imaging. The coronal plane is often essential to perceive the subtle changes in the pelvic calyceal anatomy and narrow the differential diagnosis and allow you to make the correct diagnosis. I think sometimes calyceal disease, particularly papillary necrosis, and a lesser extent perhaps medullary sponge kidney, and subtle TCCs are often very difficult. They're often misdiagnosed early on, and when they're diagnosed, there's substantial more damage to the kidney or tumor has spread beyond just the kidney. So an important thing to look at, and hopefully this lecture will help you do a better job. And with that, I thank you for your attention. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.